Hi, I'm your host, Dee Dee Chang. Audio Builders TV presents Acoustics with Jay Fergoletto. This multi-part series is an overview of acoustic topics. For a more in-depth look, we highly recommend Jay Fergoletto's book and courses. Jay is an award-winning veteran mastering engineer who has owned high-end mastering studios in Los Angeles, Atlanta, and Boston. His clients have included Alice in Chains, Annie DeFranco, Oasis, India Ari, Black Eyed Peas, Blondie, In Excess, and many more. Albums that Jay has mastered have earned a Grammy Award, as well as gold and multi-platinum record awards. He is an accomplished pianist and multi-instrumentalist. Audio Builders TV is produced by the students of Concord Carlisle High School with help from Colonial Sound and CCTV. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and subscribe to our mailing list at audiobuildersworkshop.com. <laughs> Audio Builders. Audio Builders Workshop is a work group for the Boston chapter of the Audio Engineering Society. Hi, it's Jay Frigoletto for Audio Builders TV, continuing our series of uh, talks on acoustics, and uh, we're getting out of large rooms and into small rooms now. Small rooms, of course, are recording studios, control rooms, things like that. Um, cool stuff that all of us people who play music want to have in our houses, right? <laughs> um, so let's talk about the history of control room design. Um, so in the 40s or 50s, very little attention was paid to designing a control room. It was really just called the booth or the control booth. And, uh, you know, it was mono at that point. There was a speaker in there, you know, there's a little bit of recording equipment. The uh, engineer and the producer could sort of stay in the booth to uh, um, be able to listen to what was happening, uh, prevent the machine noise from getting into the uh, recording, things like that. Uh, it was not a very critically designed space. Um, the 50s come along, and of course, stereo comes along, and now, well, this is getting a little more interesting. We have two speakers now, and we have to actually be sitting between them and have them set up in such a way that we actually can hear the phantom center and hear an image. And all of a sudden, um, symmetry in the control room becomes important. Uh, you can't have all this space over here and a really close wall right here. You're not going to get uh, an even accurate representation of what you're listening to. Uh, so people are starting to spend a little more effort uh, on um, control rooms at this point. Um, acoustic materials, you know, early on, draperies, um, this stuff that was uh, Mansfield uh, transite panels, which is asbestos and cement. I don't think we're going to get that past the building inspector today, huh? <laughs> uh, rock wool, um, acoustical tiles, uh, basically, you know, these little things with the holes in them. Like if you were, you know, ever in, uh, you know, grade school or in an old school that were stuck on the ceiling, well, they just kind of had those all over. Yeah, they're a little bit absorbent, not a whole bunch, uh, but uh, that was about what you did. I mean, they started to put up uh, in, um, in the, the large recording rooms, they, the, the acoustics were better. They had some of these big cylindrical, polycylindrical things that ha offered some diffusion. Um, they started to get used to slat resonators to do a little bit of bass absorption, um, but not much really. Uh, it, the way those were designed were, um, you know, not much absorption behind it, uh, skinny things. It really didn't go very deep. There wasn't much bass uh, absorption to speak of. Um, so around this time in the 50s, later in the 50s with the stereo, um, some of the really sort of famous studios start coming up. Um, you know, Capitol Tower in Los Angeles, uh, Chess in Chicago, Rudy Van Gelder's place uh, in New Jersey. Uh, if any of you are into jazz, check that out. You know, you definitely have a Rudy Van Gelder album in your collection. Uh, Sun in Memphis, uh, Criteria down in Miami. So some of these famous rooms, many of which are still uh, around, um, you know, obviously Capitol Towers is still around. Criteria in Miami has become Hit Factory uh, Miami. Um, so, you know, the speakers are over the, the, uh, over the windows, you know, uh, so you've got a window and you've got a soffit and they're up there. Um, but they're starting to pay a little more attention. Uh, in the 60s, um, it gets better still. Um, you've got some of the big New York rooms. Uh, 1961, uh, A&R, uh, Phil Ramone's room in New York opens. Uh, late 60s, 69, uh, John Stork, uh, still at the age of 19 years old, I believe, designed Jimi Hendrix's Electric Ladyland. That studio is definitely still around. Um, and that launched his career as a, a highly in-demand studio designer, and he's still going today. Um, so 
monitoring systems are starting to get better now, and you're actually able to hear some of the flaws that, you know, 10 years ago, you never would have noticed uh, on, on that recording. So control rooms have to get a little more sophisticated. So the 70s comes, and uh, Tom Hidley um, designs these rooms uh, for Westlake uh, Studios in, in L.A., and they start to sort of be available as sort of a package. Hey, here's how it goes. And you have these flush-mounted speakers in the wall, uh, what's called compression ceilings. Um, so these ceilings are sort of high at the front, low in the middle, high in the back. Um, very hard. The idea uh, behind these was to um, preserve amplifier power and, and get the bass to reproduce better. Of course, what it ended up doing was creating comb filtering. So now you've got this compression ceiling coming down over your head. You've got the direct sound coming at you, and then you've got a hard surface right here, and you've got a reflected sound uh, ending up at the listener's position very soon after that initial um, direct sound. And what happens? You've got these two sounds that are almost identical, uh, almost equal in uh, intensity, and they're slightly offset. Uh, the phase is changed, and what do you get? You get this um, pattern of interference that kind of, if you look at it, looks like the teeth in a comb, all these little bits that, you know, frequencies that are, are disappearing, and of course that's called comb filtering. Um, this has this sort of hollow, weird sound, the imaging isn't very good. Uh, it's definitely not what you really want for a critical uh, listening space. So, um, but some of the ideas uh, in, in these rooms were starting to be, at least, you know, they're thinking about it. Um, he started thinking about rooms um, like the way large rooms in concert halls were done and said, what if we put some of those ideas in, in these sort of reflective side walls? Uh, because in concert halls, you actually like to have some lateral reflections. Um, it's sort of, you know, it's the motor in the cracks. It fills in the space. It gives you a sense of uh, envelopment. It sort of connects the notes. Uh, nice for classical music in a big hall. Not really so good when you want to hear exactly what's happening, um, you know, on your recording or out in the studio. Um, so, moving on from the Westlake rooms, uh, what did uh, Tom Hidley do next? Um, he came up with what's called the non-environment rooms. The idea being, well, let's try to take the room itself out of the equation. Let's get that so that you don't have any of these reflections uh, coming back, um, and then you'll just hear what comes out of the monitors. So, that's a tall order. Um, to get rid of everything, to get everything to be absorbed, um, you're talking about some very large spaces outside of the part of the control room you can see. Um, this was done with uh, what's called waveguide traps, traditional quarter wave traps, where you have, um, you need the depth of the trap is going to be one quarter wavelength of the frequency that you're trying to absorb. And then in it is going to be these hangers with, um, you know, some compressed fiberglass on either side or something fuzzy on either side. The whole, these whole things are sort of lined with uh, either fluffy fiberglass or uh, rock wool. But anyway, these waveguide traps or traditional quarter wave traps take up a lot of space. Um, they definitely are very effective, but really, really difficult uh, to build and have all of these around you. So let's think about um, our calculations that we talked about in an earlier talk about, well, how do we figure out wavelength? Okay. Um, you have that um, speed of sound, C, acceleratus, uh, and you have, you know, C over the frequency gives you the wavelength, C over the wavelength gives you the frequency. So that's how you can calculate how long is this wavelength going to be. So let's think of, you know, okay, uh, we're trying to get rid of all this sound, and we know that uh, the low frequency stuff is a problem, modal behavior happening in small rooms. You know, say we want to absorb this thing at 60 hertz. Well, that's a very long wavelength, even if you're talking about a quarter wavelength, you're talking about several feet of trapping uh, that you're going to need to have. So that definitely takes some effort. Um, the other thing about these non-environment rooms is they're very dead and they're kind of weird to be in. Kind of like people that go into an anechoic chamber and just like you're used to having reflections and you're like, e eerie. Um, so they had uh, hard front walls and hard floors to try to give you enough reflections to um, at least make you feel a little more comfortable in the room. But one of the things that tended to happen with these rooms is 
people would maybe over EQ, add a little more high frequency stuff, over effect, add too much reverb because the rooms are so dead and they're used to hearing stuff give back that they try to be adding some of that that they were missing. Um, so definitely you get very, very um, detailed monitoring in these rooms. Um, but again, not perfect. Um, they have their own set of problems. So other things that ha happen in the 80s um, are live end, dead end rooms, L-E-D-E. -E. And this is where, um, this is getting closer to what we're doing today. Um, a lot of these principles uh, are being held. And as a matter of fact, there's, there's offshoots of uh, non-environment rooms that are happening today as well, um, refinements on that. Uh, so LEDE rooms, again, not exactly as they were initially thought of, but now the new, what they call RFZ, reflection-free zone rooms. Uh, these are pretty close to, to, you know, these are starting to resemble what we see. And as a matter of fact, a lot of these rooms from the 80s are still uh, in service today. Um, the idea with, uh, Live and Dead End, uh, this was uh, proposed by Don and Carolyn Davis. First one was uh, built in Las Vegas, uh, Las Vegas recording by Chips Davis. And the idea was, okay, well, you're recording something uh, in that live space um, and it's a bigger room and you've got uh, the sort of microphone that gets the direct sound and then by the time the reflections come back, you've got a certain space in between that initial signal and that reverberant sound that's coming back what they call the ITD gap, the initial time delay gap. Um, what they said was, well, if you're in the control room, it's a much smaller space, uh, and the reflections from that control room are coming back sooner than the recorded reflections that you're hearing from the studio masking the sound of the studio. This was their idea. Um, there's some you know, validity to, validity to that. Um, there's some other reasons why, eh, maybe not. Um, but again, a good, they've got a good idea here. Well, you know, we want to extend the ITD gap in the control room um, so that you can hear what's happening in the studio more. Uh, it also just uh, tends to just give you a more detailed uh, sound of, of what you're hearing, even if you're not necessarily listening to just what happened in a bigger recording room. It definitely gives you um, better monitoring that's not um, as hampered by these reflections coming back. Same thing that the non-environment rooms, they tried to eliminate the reflections altogether. Uh, the live and dead end rooms tried to just delay them enough so that they didn't interfere with the direct sound. Um, so they've got highly absorptive in front, but highly diffuse in the back. The idea was that they, after that ITD gap, or what some people call IST, the initial signal delay, because now it's coming out of a speaker electronically, Either way, ISD, ITD means the same thing. So they wanted to have a very sharp termination of that gap. So when the reverberant sound did come back, uh, it came back very diffuse in nature, but kind of with a vengeance. Uh, you had a very sharp <laughs> reflection uh, that sort of delineated when that ended. And uh, early on, they did this with, with what was called Haas kickers, these big reflectors in the back, which Again, sent these specular, hard specular reflections back to the listening position, um, delayed in time with the direct sound. Now, delayed a little more than they would have from a compression ceiling, but still pretty close, creating comb filtering. Um, so finally, uh, they came out with um, the QRD, the quadratic uh, residue diffusers. Um, Manfred Schroeder's work that uh, Dr. Peter D'Antonio with uh, RPG Systems finally came out um, in, in the early to mid 80s with these uh, mathematical diffusers um, that really could spread out that sound not only in space, but also in time. It diffuses in time. It spreads that energy out a little bit. So it creates a nice diffuse, even reverberation characteristic um, over a certain frequency range. Uh, and so that's when they started putting the diffusion in the back. That was the, the live end at that time. Um, some other things that weren't so good in these original LEDE rooms, they had an asymmetrical outer shell. Not great. The uh, bass would go right through the inner shell and come back. They thought, oh, we're diffusing bass frequencies. No, you're just moving them around, making them harder to actually predict. And you're also changing the symmetry so that all of a sudden your low frequency imaging is going to be off and skewed. Um, so those are some of the things that you know we've 
changed uh, with some of the modern versions. But that gives you the idea between, um, you know, behind uh, the, the live and dead end rooms. Again, the newer versions are what's called the RFC, the reflection free zone. Um, and, you know, now they're making the outer shells symmetrical. And as a matter of fact, they're saying, well, the, the, the sort of massive part, you can put a lot of that mass on the inner shell too if you want. Uh, that helps with the isolation. Uh, it doesn't have to be just out there. Uh, and then there's, you know, there's room geometries, the way you do the angles of things to try to make that RFZ, the reflection-free zone, even larger. Um, so other things that are sort of new, um, we've got some things that are called the uh, ambicoic idea, where instead of getting rid of all the reflections, you want to preserve the energy, but just massively diffuse it. Uh, and this is uh, something, if you look at uh, Blackbird Studios uh, in Nashville, you'll see uh, the uh, studio there that George Massenberg did with uh, uh, Peter D'Antonio. And um, it's got all these ridiculous, crazy, bizarre looking, you know, like spiky things coming in from all areas. And that's just a massive amount of diffusion uh, so that it uh, maintains the energy in the room, but gets rid of any of those weird sort of interference uh, patterns. So it evens out that response. Um, other rooms uh, nowadays, you've got uh, northward, acoustic, northward Acoustics doing FTB, front to back rooms, which this is sort of the modern take on uh, what originally started as non-environment rooms, where he's adding a second um, response path. You've got the speakers that you're still trying to have that, them see sort of a non-environment style room. Uh, but he's adding diffusion above um, the head of the listener and then behind the couch to add a little more um, of a diffuse sound field from the point of view of the people in the room. So the speakers, he wants to still see something very dead, but wants to the, the sound of when a person speaks in the room, the, the, the room occupants, uh, that they'll get a little more of that diffuse room, a little more normal room stuff back. Um, the other thing that he's doing is instead of using these big, deep waveguide traps, he's starting to use cascaded membranes, membrane traps. Much, much, much less uh, depth you need in the walls by using um, either metal plate or uh, these rubber um, membranes uh, to absorb the low frequencies. And you'll put multiple membranes on top of one another, and then you put the soft, fuzzy stuff on the front of that to handle the mids and high frequencies. And that's sort of the history of control rooms, where it's been, where it is nowadays. Some other things have to do with 5.1, surround sound, uh, even more, I mean, Dolby Atmos, 10.2, things like that, where you need to have some diffusion in front. You need to figure out uh, more complex geometries for speakers being in multiple places. Um, but anyway, that's sort of the greatest hits of control room design, past and present. Again, Jay Frigoletto for Audio Builders TV. We'll see you again on the next one.